So appropriate uh, as we begin a new year. And Bruce, I'm afraid that my clicker may have just run out of battery. So you may have to do that for me if you can get the uh, PowerPoint up there for me. We'll see how it works. Let me see. Is this going to work? Ah, it did. It does work. Okay. My little green light went out and I thought something was broken, but maybe not. And you know, it's, it's difficult for me. I've already told you. Weeks ago, I told you how much I hate taking down the Christmas tree, right? And it's not just because I don't like cramming it back in the box and putting it back in the garage and everything, but because it symbolizes the season that we all enjoy so much, I just hate putting it away. But we always have to do it pretty promptly because we have people in our home, good bed, and you don't want them to catch you up catch you with your Christmas tree up in January, right? And so we did. We got it done pretty promptly and, and did that. But I'm still back in transition from Christmas to New Year mode. And so, and it's not just because I've missed being with you the last couple of weeks. I still really am. And I'm still thinking ahead, okay, Lord, what, what does this new year have in store for me? And I want to be attentive And I want to be watching, I want to be real responsive, and I really do want to walk closely with him this year. And one of the ways that over the years of my life that I've been a follower of the Lord, one of the ways that he's taught me how to do that is he's given me great examples along the way. And sometimes when I can't come up with an idea on my own about what it would look like today to really walk closely with the Lord... He'll give me somebody in my life who does that well, and I get to follow their example. In a few minutes, we're going to look at the example of some men. We call them the wise men. And though they're a part of the Christmas story, it was actually a part of the Christmas story that could have taken place as much as two years after the birth of Jesus. So it's an okay that we kind of stay back on a Christmas theme and also be thinking about a New Year's theme because that all fits. It, it all matches there. But I do like what you guys post. And I think it was James Green that put this up a few weeks ago. James, did you do that? Can we blame that on you? You don't think so? I was going to give you credit for that. Yeah. I actually wrote it down, so I think I remember better than you do. (laughs) I think you may have posted that on your Facebook, but I liked it. And you know what? I just take that personally. That you wish me, James Green, 12 months of happiness. I thank you for that. And I do for you and everybody in this room and the other list down there. Wouldn't it be great? And I, I really am. I'm personally... In our family, 2016 had some challenges. And so that 2016 was, right, is the preacher supposed to say this? You know, don't let the door hit you in the butt on the way out. You know, that's kind of how it felt to me. And if we're not supposed to say that, you can edit that out. Uh, but um, that's how it felt. And so I really do feel good. I'm glad to see a 2017 come along and look forward to it a lot. And, you know, some of us like setting goals. And I like, I can't remember who I need to give credit to for this, this post here. But, you know, I guess we can really stretch ourselves out there too far. So you don't want to, you know, go wild on this goal stuff. But uh, so it may be like that. Important, you know, just sleep in more and remain fat. Okay. We'll cheer you on anyway. And uh, uh, hopefully that's not your case. But really, in this new year, I want to look to the example of some men who really inspire me. And some men whose example I want to follow. And so we're going to look at that actually toward the tail end of the Jesus born in a barn story, the uh, the wise men's uh, appearance. And just think of it this way with me, you know. Mary first, then Joseph, each of them had to be onboarded to this idea that, you know, Jesus was a Messiah and that Mary was going to bear him. And uh, that was difficult for them to do that. We talked about that some weeks ago. And, you know, not everybody in their community onboarded very quickly. There's, in fact, a lot of evidence of some, a lot of people still didn't believe them. And thought the worst of Mary and thought the worst of Joseph because of Jesus. But even if it were as much as two years after, think of it. uh, This promised Messiah whom Mary had given birth to. uh, So far, all he had to show for himself was a pile of dirty diapers. 
And I picture Mary in some version, two years, maybe even as much later, of postpartum depression. And, I mean, they're well into this chapter in their lives, but there's still people who think they made that story up. And so, you know, how good would it feel for some people who others considered really wise men, people who others looked up to and whose opinions they asked, and what if these men showed up to affirm you and to affirm if you were Mary? Man, that, that would be really welcome, wouldn't it? Well, that's really what happened here. You know, even in a time, we don't have any evidence that Mary's parents or Joseph's parents were even giving them support that all of us want to give as grandparents. And we didn't see that happening. Maybe that's why the wise men's story happened. And maybe that's why we still have it today. Well, you know, there is a star in the story, a literal star. And uh, uh, we, we don't have time this morning to address it well and also these wise men whose example I want to follow in 2017 but I did want to uh, re reference something a few years ago I saw this movie how many of the rest of you have seen this movie the star of Bethlehem some of you have yeah really worth the trouble isn't it yeah great movie and uh, there's there's a man who was just impre impressed upon him in fact it was probably God probably picked him to really give his attention to an academic study of the star of Bethlehem. And he did so. And you can look, go to a website. You can even order this movie, really good movie, at www.bethlehemstar.com. And so, in light of that, didn't have time really to talk about the star. There's a lot of good stuff there that we could talk about. But you can do it on your own. You know, bethlehemstar.com. You can actually order this uh, DVD in the movie, and it would be well worth your time. But uh, we, we won't be able to uh, really take some time to look at that today. But let's talk about these men. Who were these men who, you know, the King James translation of the Bible called them magi? And a literal trans translation of that word would be magicians. It comes from the root word magic. And, you know, in 2017... You know, we know better than put a great deal of credence to someone who would say he works magic. In fact, during my lifetime, magicians have been called, uh, the, the, we've changed what we even call them. They're illusionists instead of magicians, are they not today? And we have a friend who's a pastor in, in Canada who is also an illusionist. And it's a gift that God gave him. I mean, not to do magic. And he's the first one to say, this, there's nothing magic about this. I'm just tricking you. But he uses that as a means of communicating the gospel. He does it really, really well. Well, these men really were thought of other, by other people to have insight and even perception and even powers that not the normal person would have. But in the world in which they lived, that was still an okay thing. It, yesterday, Kelly and I were at the... Uh, at, in the hospital, the old hospital of the old uh, Fort uh, Davis, uh, Fort Davis, you know, it was, a, it was a U.S. military fort, and they have the old hospital there, and some of the, man, I don't have any better word than utensils that physicians in that day would have used. It's just like, oh my goodness, I'm glad I'm here now, and I'm glad I wasn't there then, I'm glad whoever had that wasn't my doctor, but, you know, we have changed our idea in the, med in the practice of medicine and even in the, the practice of discernment. You know, what would be normal or acceptable today. But these men very much were respected among their peers. Now, they were from the east, says that, you know, wise men from the east, from probably Persia, or modern day, what we would call Iran. And so, these guys were foreigners. But they were foreigners who were men of stature and a people in their own culture would have really looked up to. In fact, if we're going to see in a few minutes, even the way that Herod treated them. You know, he was the king, really was, and uh, Roman king, and the way he treated them. He respected them. He believed them. 
And so these were men that a lot of people were looking up to. And so we do well to look up to them and to their uh, example today. Another thing about these men, they were also considered scholars. They were learned men. They had been to school. They were students still. And that's why, as they studied the stars, they had this impression that that one star was a sign for them from God about the birth of Messiah. Something that I pick up in that story too is, you know, how if these men were magi who lived in Iran, and their worldview said that the stars can tell us something about what God's up to, that you and I don't think that that may be true. That doesn't really matter. But that that's what they thought would be what God would do. Guess what? God met them right where they were. And he spoke the language that they understood. And to them, if they were looking for a sign from God in a star, guess what God gave them? sign in a star. Isn't that good? Met them right where they were. Let's read this. Maybe I just, wow, it went back on. Wow. Maybe I'm like these magi who knew things that were happening that other people couldn't tell. <laughs> but uh, hey, it's working right now. Let's go for it. Nick's got me plugged in and going. Let's keep going. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 2, okay? And I do have the, uh, uh, the words on that if you have binoculars. <laughs> it's long. Let's go with this one, okay? We can do this. Uh, let's, let's read this story together, and you can look it up in your very own Bible. Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read verse 1 through 12 together, and uh, unless you have binoculars, like I said. You know what? Since I had eye surgery, I can read that. I really can, and I can't take credit for that, but I know the uh, eye surgeon who gave me. Yeah. So some of you can read that. If I can, I know some of you can. Let's read it together. Turn your Bibles, if you'd prefer. Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read 12 verses about wise men. And here we go. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, remember it's after, during the time of King Herod, we knew that, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Good verb there. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. And they answered, in, Be in Bethlehem in Judah, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people. Now verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go! And search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they'd heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen, when it rose, it went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Cool story, huh? Amazing. Amazing that these men would have been so attentive and so perceptive 
and that God would have met them right where they were to lead them right where Jesus was. All an indication of the care of the Lord, but also the sovereignty of the Lord. And just some of the things that I really admire about this man. Um, you know, isn't it interesting? Notice the contrast. When they went to Herod, you know, Herod, Herod summoned them. They went to him. Guess what they didn't do? They didn't bow down to Herod. He was the king that everybody recognized. But then when they came to the home where Jesus was with his mother Mary, what did they do? The very first thing, they knelt. You know, I really appreciated the songs that you guys picked a while ago. And two of the songs in particular talking about standing to worship him. The last two songs we sang. And isn't it sometimes in worship, God compels us to stand before. I've right over here. I've done that before. You, you guys would be leading us and I would feel compelled to stand in honor of the Lord. And then other times we feel compelled to sit. You know, everybody else around us sometimes worshiping, singing. Sometimes I just need to sit. Sometimes we've felt the need to kneel before him. All those appropriate expressions, are they not? Each an expression of reverence. And that, that God has broken through in the worlds that we live in. You know, we live in tangible worlds where, you know, the stuff that, that the people around us think is real is only that which you can touch. And yet he has invaded our world to the extent that we know reality is born beyond that which we can touch. And he calls upon us to worship, to worship him, to kneel before him sometimes, even to sing. You know, I'm not much of a singer. I'm really not. I appreciate those of you who are, though. And while you're singing, I'll join in. And, and you help me to worship. If I were here by myself, singing probably wouldn't be the way that that would happen. But when I'm with you and you're singing, I'm compelled to join with you in this corporate worship. You know, these guys, it wasn't one. We don't know that it was three. They had three different kinds of gifts. But they came as a group. And, and they had the fellowship that a group has. And they were able to worship corporately, maybe even in a way like me. I worship better corporately than I do by myself. And that's one of the things that I want to get better at this year, 2017. I have literally have it written down. I want to be more attentive and respond more readily to worship. The first thing these guys did, they knelt before him. They worshiped. I want to follow their example. <clears throat> then it says that they presented gifts. You know, the whole gift-giving thing. Aren't you glad that that's part of Christmas? I really am. And not just as a kid when, you know, my grace was concerned was what was I going to get for Christmas. But as a parent, how fun it was to think ahead and buy gifts for our children and see the delight that it gave them. And you always hoped, you know, even though, you know, the fat man in, in the suit with the beard got all the credit at one early time, you really hoped that they also knew that those were things that were expressions of care and love from us, me and Kelly. And I remember when Chris got his little Game Boy, he was so mesmerized by that thing. And I hoped he knew that it was an expression of love. The whole idea of giving and receiving gifts at Christmas time, guess who we owe that to? We owe it to these guys. They were the ones, the first givers of gifts at the Christmas time. And it's such a normal part of our expression of Christian, I think, Christ, our, our own Christian faith. I think we can forget, where did that come from? It came from Matthew chapter 2. That's why we give gifts to one another at Christmas time. Real appropriate. Real appropriate that we do so, especially when we want them to be received as an expression as our love for the individual, an expression of our love for the Lord. Yeah, that gifts can do that kind of double duty. So they gave gifts, and we're going to talk about those 
and with some specificity. Some of you guys know Dr. Bill Fowler. Teaches, he used to teach at Howard Payne. Now he's at the Yellowstone Theological Institute in Bozeman, Montana. But uh, Bill wrote a thing about the gifts that these guys gave. And uh, it helped me, and I can't say it any better than he did, so I'm just going to read this to you, okay? This is a paragraph from Dr. Bill Fowler. When we think of the gifts presented to Jesus by the wise men who came from the East, it's easy to fo focus on the obvious, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These were indeed perfect gifts. Some Christmas gifts do not fit well, right? Whether due to size or color or personality, we've all received gifts that did not fit, but the gifts the Magi gave were a good fit for Jesus. Gold, let's look at each of the three of these. It was a gift worthy of a king. Guess what? By April 15th, each of us is going to give <laughs> a part of our treasure, you know, to our government. So gold, fitting for a king, they gave gold. You know what's interesting to me? I just think about this week and the weeks leading up to today that I've been reading this. It didn't even say how much. You know, that's what we were wrong. How much? <laughs> it didn't even say how much. But the element itself was a gift that was worthy of a king, gold given to the king. Frankincense, I remember as a kid wondering, what in the world was that and whatever it is, I'm glad I didn't get it for Christmas. Frankincense, an indispensable item for a priest. Incense. And even today in some of our Christian traditions, incense is burned, symbolic of the permeating and ever-filling presence of the Holy Spirit. Would have been indispensable gift for a priest, Jesus. Our, you know, one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, priest. So, incense, frankincense, good. Myrrh. What in the world is myrrh? That was a kid. I was glad I didn't get myrrh for Christmas. But here's what it was. It's appropriate for one who was going to die because it was an element that was used in the preparation of a body, you know, to embalm the body before birth. And so these men weren't only so sensitive that God really could speak to them through a star. They were so sensitive that perfectly appropriate gifts they brought to this baby King Jesus. Perfect gifts. You know, somebody said that after those guys left well and good, but uh, somebody much more pragmatic needed to follow. Have you seen this before? <laughs> Fresh diapers, casserole, and lots of formula. Maybe so. But that these guys gave gifts. And I want to just talk about that for a few minutes. And that this would be another part of their example. Um, another thing that impressed me along the way, even before we... The, they worshipped and presented themselves. Um, they were attentive. You know, it's one of the things that we enjoy about little bitty kids, don't we? They're in explore mode all the time. You know, uh, our granddaughter, 14-year-old granddaughter Aiden, cannot walk into a room. If something has been moved, she will notice it. And she's so attentive. You know, the attentiveness of these men. They were well learned already. They were, had already studied. People already looked up to them, but they hadn't quit learning. They were still pursuing understanding. They were still curious. And how often that is contrast to, if any of you have been in, you know, a higher education, like a university campus setting, oftentimes the mood there is, We've already learned it. Now sit down and let us teach you. It can often be the case that we're out of learning mode. We've already learned. In fact, I mentioned a few weeks ago, a PhD sometimes is referred to as a terminal degree. What does terminal mean? I've quit learning. I already know everything. No, these men were still observant. They were still studious. They were still attentive. They were still curious. And you know what? Just think about it, especially coming from, 
you know, observatory yesterday. The universe is of such a size. The reflection that only an infinite God could have made. And that we wouldn't keep on being curious. Because an infinite God, there's still things about him I have yet to really get. Lots of him I have yet to really get. Again, one time comparing myself to one of the grandkids, saying some things about God, her perspective about what God's like. And I was thinking, oh, that's really cute. One of these days you'll really get it. And then I felt God saying, Robert, you don't get it either. <laughs> Your understanding of me is still infantile. So much more to learn of him. I want to stay studious. I want to stay mystified, curious, still learning, still discovering. I hope in 2017 to be blown away by God. I hope he blows me away. But if I'm not curious still, if I'm still not attentive, I'll miss it. Think of all the people in the whole wide world who missed the star. <laughs> These men were watching. And I want to be that attentive. Oh, man, what a good, that's kind of a tangent. But in their understanding of who Jesus was. Think about, think about it again. You know, there was the king. They didn't bow to him. There's this little baby. He may have been at most two years old. They walked into the room. What'd they do? Bowed to him. Man. These men who were accustomed to other people giving them their respect. They, their very first thing they did in the presence of Jesus to go to their knees. I think that means they were blown away by him. I, I want to be blown away by him and not miss him. And then look what they did. Then they gave. Isn't it natural when you, when you, when you care and appreciate about something about someone, you, you want to give. Whether it starts with a compliment to a gift that takes months and months and months to come up with and to pull off. They gave. First of all, their time. You know, these guys came from far away. And uh, I was thinking of it this morning. This trip that we made getting here this morning, according to the museum we were at yesterday at Fort Davis, it would have been a 14-day trip. We got here in three and a half hours. And that was only because it was foggy and we couldn't drive 75 miles an hour. And you know, you whiz over the Pecos River. Whew, gone. And there was a day when people dreaded getting to the Pecos River. And if they got, if they crossed it and everybody was still here, then they said, man, glad we did that. And we can blink and just go, whew, Pecos River, gone. These men went to a lot of trouble to make this trip. You know, there was a day when travel was really, really dangerous. And it's not, wasn't even long ago, a hundred years ago. Travel in this country was dangerous. And these guys, day and time, travel was a dangerous thing. But they were so compelled by the sign of the star that they wanted to go see Jesus for himself. And what are out? These are men that had lives, and they had families, and they had jobs, and they had people depending on them, and they had the same kind of responsibility that you and I do. They said, we've got to go. And they pulled the plug on everything else that they had going on in life and gave themselves to the pursuit of, we must see this in person. We must see him ourselves. So the first thing they gave was this time. This morning when I got here, you know, I had this whole crew up here practicing. And that was just a little part of it that I saw. You know, they start, Marilyn, you guys started this morning, didn't you? After practice working on next Sundays, right? That's what I thought that you were doing back here in this room. And so these guys are an example. You guys are an example to me too, you guys who lead us on Sunday mornings in worship. The time you put into it, you give your very time. You know what, when it really comes to it, the most invaluable thing that any of us has to give to anybody is our T-I-M-E. 
If I'm giving you my time, I'm giving you the most valuable thing that I have. Like you guys have given us this morning in your preparation and in your presentation. But these men gave time. This would have been a journey that would have probably taken weeks. Weeks. And they took. Their lives were not so busy that they could not stop for the king. And they did. They unplugged from the rest of their lives. Gave their time. This is a church, you, uh, you guys probably get tired of me saying it. You do this so well, so many of you, week in, week out, give so much of yourselves, your time to this body. And you're a great example of me, to me. And I thank you for reminding me how good that is. You know, you, they gave their time, then they gave their treasure. They really did, they gave their treasure. Did you ever notice it, that it's really exactly in the middle? If you're watching the clock, like some of you are right now, if you're watching the clock during these services, when we get to 1130, guess what's going on at 1130? Right in the middle of this worship hour, we give. It's the middle of the service. As we stop, and just like Roy Jr., is that okay to call you that? Okay, Roy Jr. <laughs> it's because there is a Roy Sr. And thank you, we do pray for your dad to get well all the way fast. But, uh, you know, Roy Jr. came and prayed, Lord, we're going to give back to you. And the reason we're doing that is because we think that you're going to be a great steward. You know, of whatever portion of my income that I'm going to give, it's a statement of trust. God will be a better steward of this than I can be. And so I'm going to write my check. And I'm going to send it. I'm going to give it. And we're going to pray that it will go and do things that none of us could have ever done with that same money. Now, why we do it? Right in the middle, every single Sunday, we stop and say, Okay, God, we're going to follow these men's example. We're going to give. We're going to give some of our treasure. We're giving our time, even to come on a Sunday morning, but we're going to give our treasure too. And we do so. See why these men are such a great example to me? What if we follow their example in 2017? I think it'll be good, don't you? Yeah. I want to be blown away. I want to worship well. I want to give generously my time and of my treasure. If we do that in 2017, I think you'll get the honor. I don't think we will. Yeah. Let's pray together and conclude that way. Worship team, if you want to make your way this way. Lord, thank you for giving us these men's stellar example, men that we still look up to today, 2,000 years later. Help us be more like them. And if you do, we'll know that it's because you're working in our lives and it's not us. Because, Lord, if I become more generous with my time and my treasure, and I know better than take credit for that, I give it to you. And, Lord, the times that you blow me away and I stop, and I either feel compelled to stand or to sit or to kneel in your presence, well, I know that it's you who did that. So I thank you, Lord. For giving us these men, help us to follow their examples well. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.